Welcome everyone. This is Colleen McCarthy O'Toole from QRSMA. Thank you so much for joining us today. We would like to thank our sponsors, Avaxis, Biogen, and Genentech Roche for their generous support of the Summit of Strength virtual webinar series. We're excited to receive so many questions in advance of this webinar, and we're going to try to answer many of these during this presentation. You can also submit questions during the call using the chat box in the bottom right hand side of the screen. Lines will remain muted during the call other than the speakers. If you have any additional questions after today's presentation, please contact fam the Family Support Team at CureSMA at familysupport at curesma.org. We would like to introduce our first speaker, Stacy Tarrant, who will be presenting on SMA Nutrition now more than ever. Stacy, Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to thank CureSMA uh, as well as all the sponsors for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I, I really titled this talk now more than ever because I think what's on all the minds of all of us and all the people with SMA and their caregivers right now is staying as healthy as possible during this pandemic. And I think that people are really realizing that good nutrition uh, is a basic building block of overall good health. So, with that, oops, oh, sorry. With that said, uh, what I'm going to discuss with you today is, first of all, balanced nutrition for people with SMA, uh, with recommend recommendations for foods to include in a healthful diet. Throughout the talk, I'm going to be throwing in some tips and considerations that are applicable to our current uh, situation with the pandemic. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, some tips on managing sick days at home. So I would say that one of the questions I get asked most frequently is what is the best diet for someone with SMA? And my answer is always that, oh shoot, sorry, that every person with SMA is truly unique. And I would say that that's true now more than ever with all of the different abilities and strengths that people are achieving with the new treatments, but also recognizing that there are many in the SMA community who are not receiving treatment. And so uh, we have to be ready to make recommendations for uh, all abilities. And so when I have a nutrition consultation with a person with SMA, the most important thing that I have to do is to really listen to the parents, patients, and their caregivers to learn about the particular uh, clinical symptoms, circumstances, and issues of each individual person. And then I use my professional experience in working with people with SMA for the past 12 years to come up with a tailored nutrition plan that's going to work for that particular person. So, why is good nutrition important? There are so many reasons, and especially for people with SMA. So first of all, good nutrition helps children grow and can help adults maintain a healthy weight. It's going to provide energy to help op optimize motor and pulmonary function. It's going to help prevent nutrition-linked diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. A well-nourished person is definitely going to recover from illness faster when they do get sick. Eating more healthful foods is also going to improve digestion and reduce GI problems like constipation. It's important for the health of our bones, but also improves our outward appearance, like our hair, our nails, our skin. And for those being treated with the new SMA therapies, good nutrition is definitely going to provide the energy that you need to get the most out of your treatment. But one thing that I always have to keep in mind is that food is a source of enjoyment. So that's always a factor in coming up with a nutrition plan for someone as we don't want, uh, I would never ask somebody to eat food that they don't enjoy. So good nutrition is really all about balance. 
And the first place that we try to achieve balance is with calorie intake. So think of calories as energy because that they really do mean one and the same. Calories uh, are, we think of calories that we take in, our energy intake, and calories that we burn or the energy that we burn. So children who are still growing are going to need a bit more calories or energy than they're burning in order to grow. But for adults, in order to maintain their weight, we really are trying to shoot for energy or calorie intake equal to energy or calories burned. In general, I would say that people with SMA need less overall calories than people who don't have SMA. And this is really due to you know, uh, less muscle mass and also just um, not as much ability to participate in as much physical activity. But how many calories a particular person with SMA needs is very individualized. And it's really gonna depend on their particular level of activity as well as other factors. The one thing I will say is that I have seen, um, in my experience, people treated with the new therapies do seem to have higher calorie, higher calorie needs after receiving treatment than before uh, when they were not receiving treatment. Okay, so the next way that we try to achieve balance is with the different nutrients that provide calories. And we can't really have optimal health without including all three of these in our diet. And these are the only three nutrients that provide calories. So protein, fat, and carbohydrate. But how much of those is needed of each of them? So for protein, a good range is about one half to one gram per pound of body weight. Um, anywhere in that range uh, is fine uh, for any person. If someone gets a, you know, a little bit more, it's okay. Adequate protein is going to help promote, promote growth for children and it's gonna help, help to minimize muscle breakdown and loss. But one thing I do wanna say is that extra protein is not gonna build more muscle and it's not gonna make people with SMA stronger if they're already getting adequate protein. Um, the protein is able, if, if you take in more protein than you need, it is able to convert to fat, just like anything that else that we eat in excess. Okay, with regards to fat, we generally recommend somewhere between 20 to 35% of calories to come from fat. Uh, that number is definitely higher for infants and children under the age of two. Uh, if you think about it, breast milk, uh, which is the perfect food for infants, is between 50 and 55% of calories. Uh, and the reason that it's so high in fat is that fat is very important for brain development. And since, you know, under the age of two, that's when the, the biggest um, uh, uh, amount of brain development is going on. That's when we want to, the diet to, diet to be higher in fat. So we definitely don't want to follow any kind of a low fat diet for during those years. Uh, if you have too much fat in your diet, um, for this for older people, it definitely can increase reflux. Um, and if you're at risk for aspiration, it's definitely not good to get fat in your lungs. But too little fat is also a problem because that can result in things like essential fatty acid deficiency, which leads to poor brain development, uh, it can also lead to dry, scaly skin, um, poor healing of pressure ulcers or wounds. Uh, it can be a problem with blood clotting. Uh, it can cause uh, increased inflammation, poor muscle movement, and also poor absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins and, mineral and minerals, which are so important. And then the remainder of your diet should be made up of about, uh, car from carbohydrate at about 50 to 60% of calories. So what are good choices within each of those categories? So for proteins, we definitely have our animal proteins uh, and those are great complete sources of protein. So things like eggs, milk, yogurt, 
uh, lean meats, chicken, and fish. But certainly um, a vegetarian or vegan diet can also be good for a person with SMA, uh, where you're getting your protein or your complete proteins from a mix of beans and grains. Um, nuts are also a great source of vegetarian protein, and even vegetables uh, have a little bit of protein. So usually I find that most people, like a lot, a lot of parents who come to see me and think that their children are not getting enough protein when we actually talk through uh, their diets, uh, we really find out that they are. It's really hard to uh, not be getting enough protein. Okay, with regards to fat, um, we want to choose uh, healthy sources of fat that are rich in the essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6. For the omega-3 fatty acids, the fatty fish like salmon and halibut and tuna tend to be good sources of those. Um, but there are also uh, vegetable sources like uh, hemp milk and avocado. Well, avocado is not a source of essential fatty acid, but it is a healthful fat. But the uh, plant oils, and especially walnut, canola, and flaxseed, uh, are very rich in the omega-3 fatty acids. And particularly, uh, I like walnut oil because it has the best balance of omega-3 and omega-6, the two important essential fatty acids. And then uh, for carbohydrates, very important to choose complex carbohydrates those that are high in fiber, um, like whole grain breads, uh, cereals and pastas, um, beans and legumes. Now beans and legumes, you notice we're on the protein, in the protein list. They're also uh, in the carbohydrate list and they're super high in fiber. Um, so they're a really great source of both protein and carb, as well as fruits and vegetables. And really limiting kind of the more sugary, um, like fruit juices or, um, you know, cakes and cookies. And not to say that those have to be completely excluded from a diet, but really sort of making those more of treats than, uh, than the uh, regular intake. Okay. Then the third arena where we want to achieve balance is with the nutrients that don't provide any calories, but are essential for normal function in the body which are the vitamins and minerals. So sometimes people will ask me, they'll say, my child has difficulty gaining weight, what vitamins can I give? And really vitamins supplements are never gonna help someone gain weight because you really need calories in order to do that. But the, all of these things are still very important for body function. The best source of vitamins and minerals is really from a variety of helpful foods. And if I have patients who tell me if I do a diet recall and they're telling me that they eat a very uh, widely varied diet with lots of fruits and vegetables included, then I usually will not even recommend any vitamins. So that's what your dietitian can help you do is uh, go through your diet and kind of identify any possible nutrient deficiencies and make some suggestions for supplements if you are unable to get a sufficient amount from your diet. We usually don't recommend over supplementation, so we wanna make sure that you're getting enough, but we don't wanna give you excess because this actually can be a source of undue stress on the body. Now, particular uh, mineral and vitamin that we pay attention to uh, is calcium and vitamin D because these are super important for bone health and people who are non-ambulatory, not able to walk or bear weight, are at risk for bone fracture. And then I also know that there are many people in the SMA community, community who avoid dairy. So these are just some guidelines about how much of each are recommended, and they are based on age. And just to note that most calcium supplements that you will buy in the store or online are going to contain vitamin D as well, because vitamin D does help uh, with absorption of calcium into the bones. But if you do prefer you to get your calcium and vitamin D from foods, 
Here's, these are some suggestions for foods that are good sources. You want to aim for three to four servings each day. Um, for calcium, dairy products are really the sort of the highest containing sources of calcium. Um, but orange juice is also fortified with, uh, can be fortified. Not all orange juices are fortified. You have to pick one that says calcium fortified. But it is generally, uh, eight, it is fortified to the extent that eight ounces of orange juice would provide about the same calcium as eight ounces of milk. And then there are also uh, some green vegetables that contain uh, calcium, such as broccoli and other dark green leafy vegetables. They just don't have quite as much, so you would need more servings of those. With regards to foods that are high in vitamin D, the ones that are mostly like uh, that are naturally high in vitamin D again would be your fatty fish like salmon and tuna. But there are a lot of foods out there that are additionally fortified with vitamin D, like our milk. Our basically our whole milk supply is is fortified with vitamin D. Um, yogurt, uh, orange juice, and some cereals. Now, alternatively, our bodies can make vitamin D very well with exposure to the sun. And given that we've all been stuck in our homes for a while, uh, this is a great time of year to just sit out in the sunshine of your backyard for 15 to 30 minutes and let the body, your body do the work for you. The only caveat is that when you're spending time in the sun, it does have to be without sunscreen in order for your body to make its own vitamin D. Okay, so uh, fluid, I always wanna talk about fluid. While it's not a nutrient, it's still so important to our body's function because about 60% of our bodies are made up of water. So the amount of fluid that you need is really gonna be, be, sorry, depend on your body weight, your age, and your clinical condition. But on average, adults are going to need about a half an ounce per, per pound of body weight. And for children, it's a bit more, uh, about one and a half ounces per pound of body weight. Now your fluid needs are definitely going to increase if you're sick, or have, uh, have a fever with sweating, or if you have a lot of secretions, because those are all sources of water losses. We generally recommend plain water or flavored waters, uh, if you're drinking them, as the best sources. And we really uh, discourage intake of things like soda, uh, fruit juice, juice drinks, and other sugar sweetened beverages because these are really just uh, empty calories that don't really help with fullness. And some people think, you know, that 100% fruit juice uh, is much healthier, but the body really treats it almost like it would soda or juice drink. It raises your blood sugar really fast and then your blood sugar drops, leaving you feel feeling hungry again. So rather than drinking fruit juice, you're much better off actually eating a piece of fruit. Now, if you are somebody who must have juice, then I would recommend sticking with 100% fruit juice, but really having no more than eight ounces per day. Okay, so a lot of people uh, during the pandemic have been asking the question, how can I boost my immunity so that I stay healthy during this time? And unfortunately, there are no specific foods or specific supplements that will boost your immunity to help protect against the COVID-19 infection. However, that doesn't really stop companies from trying to market supplements that say that they'll do just that. So I would definitely be uh, beware of those. Your best bet is really to start eating as healthfully as possible and trying to maintain a healthy weight. This is gonna help you avoid some of those nutri nutrition-related health problems, like the ones I mentioned before, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, that have been actually shown during the pandemic to result in poorer outcomes when someone does become infected. Okay, and now just a little aside, 
about obtaining food during the pandemic. So some SMA families have been worried, I think, about going food shopping or even worried that the virus may get into their homes from food packaging. Luckily, most grocery stores are really stepping up and offering delivery or contactless curbside pickup. And also, don't be afraid to ask friends and family uh, who live nearby. They're usually happy to help. And if the usual, so there, I know like depending on what uh, area of the country you live in, um, you may find shortages of some food or maybe some of the usual foods that you buy are not available. This is a great time when everyone's home to try experimenting with new foods and maybe trying some more helpful options. You know, you can Google just about any ingredient and find a ton of recipes. Um, and who knows, you might just find a new food that you didn't know you liked. Now, if you are very worried about transmission of the virus on packaging, you can certainly wipe down the packaging with disinfectant when the groceries come into your home and before storing them. Um, I hope this goes without saying, but never use dis disinfectant directly on a food. And then just wash all your produce uh, underwater like you would do normally before eating. Um, it seems like they really don't think that the, um, that the virus is transmitted by food. And, and part of the theory I think on that is that uh, they don't really think that the virus would uh, actually um, survive your stomach acid. So if, if it's going right through the digestive tract and into your stomach, the acids in there are pretty potent. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears again and talk about tube feedings. So G-tubes, and, and actually any kind of tube, J-tube, G-tube, they can be used in many different ways. And getting a feeding tube does not necessarily mean that it's the end of oral eating. So some people use them for medications and fluids only. Some people use them uh, only on sick days uh, or if they, they don't feel like eating or they're just not eating well for on a particular day. Uh, some people will eat orally during the day and then uh, do an overnight feeding for extra calories. Or alternatively, um, for if you don't want to do an overnight feeding, you can have oral meals during the day and then maybe at the end of each meal, if you weren't able to eat enough to meet your calorie needs, you can do a little bit of tube feeding at the end of an oral meal. And then of course, we know that some people need to get most or all of their nutrition because of uh, unsafe swallowing issues. But even if you have to get all of your nutrition from a tube, there are many different ways to administer it. So some people, because of tolerance issues, need complete continuous feeding over 24 hours, or maybe a few hours less than that to, to uh, allow time off of the pump for cares. Uh, other people might do bolus feedings using a pump where they're running a specific amount over an hour or two hours. And then uh, some people might actually be able to tol tolerate bolus by syringe, where you're actually just putting formula into a syringe, um, hooking it up to the tube, and either letting it drip in by gravity or slowly uh, using a plunger uh, to sort of push it through slowly. So there are lots of ways to do it, and um, we really sort of, the, our goal is always to do um, the spend the least amount of hours feeding as long as the patient is tolerating it. So luckily, there are more options than ever for those who want their tube feeding formulas to be either plant-based or me made from real foods. Um, there's a lot, so many more options out there than, than what used to be available to the tube feeding community. Uh, so let me just go through a few of these because they really do uh, differ. So the one you see in the top left corner 
Uh, that's one called Real Food Blends. And that one is, is really, it's just like blended food in a pouch. It does not contain anything else. It is not fortified with vitamins and minerals. Uh, it is just blended up food. And it comes in about five or six different uh, meals, if you will. Uh, and, you know, people ask, well, do I need a, a supplement with that? And if you're using like all of the different varieties, that should be giving you a good variety of food. The, the one thing that's really missing uh, from there is any dairy. And so uh, it really is lacking in calcium. So if I have any patients on this particular um, blenderized food, I always recommend that they give a calcium with vitamin D supplement. To the right of that is the standard complete pediatric, which we've been using for a long time. It was actually one of the first kind of food-based formulas but more like the consistency of a formula like Pediasure. So it, it can actually be used with a pump and it goes nicely through both G-tubes and J-tubes. Um, it is fortified with vitamins and minerals. Um, and like I said, it was sort of the first of its kind using real food ingredients. Now we've gotten so many more. So the, the makers of Complete Pediatric, if you now switch to the uh, left uh, bottom row, we have complete pediatric organic blends, and then the one in the middle is a Pediasure Harvest. And these both are blended food formulas that are fortified with vitamins and minerals. So we've had a lot of, of patients really liking to use those. Then with regards to plant-based formulas, uh, lower right corner, we have Kate Farms, which is not, it's not a real food formula, but it is a plant-based organic formula and it comes in both a standard whole protein or a peptide or broken down protein version. And then in the upper right corner, we have both Nourish and Liquid Hope, which are vegan, plant-based, real food formulas uh, where the, um, the proteins in those come from beans and legumes. They, it is, they are fortified uh, with vitamins and minerals. And within the last just few months, uh, that company has also come out with peptide versions of those. So, so many good commercial options now. I think that that helps families feel really good about uh, the ingredients in these, in these without actually having to make their own uh, blended feeds. Okay, so, the good news has been uh, that during the pandemic, the formula companies have been able to keep up their production for the most part. So there really has been very little shortage of formulas. Um, the one thing that you may find is that uh, shipping and delivery may take a little longer. I know like anything that I've been ordering online lately, it's been taking a long time to ship even from Amazon. Uh, so you might want to plan for this when you're planning to reorder. If you do happen to have any trouble with your formula supply uh, or your DME provider not getting the formula to you in time, many of the formula manufacturers have been offering to ship samples uh, directly to patients' homes. So if this has been an issue for you, I would encourage you to contact either your dietitian, who usually most of our, us have good uh, relationships with our formula reps, um, and we just need to give them a call and often, and they'll just ship things out. Or you can call the customer service line of the formula manufacturer directly for help, and they're, they're usually very, very willing to help. So a lot of the questions that you all submitted when you registered for this talk were asking about safe fasting intervals. And that of course brings us to the topic of overnight feeding and whether it's necessary. So again, as with most other answers to this type of question, uh, it really does depend on the health and nutrition status of the particular individual. But for some general guidelines, so in general, a person with SMA who is well, so they are not sick at all, and they are well nourished, um, for people who have never developed the ability to sit, 
They can typically fast for six to eight hours when well. Uh, and for people who are a bit stronger and have developed the ability to sit, they can typically fast for 10 to 16 hours without any issues or any worries about hypoglycemia. And truly under most circumstances, overnight feeding is not necessary for children over the age of one. And I would say that this is even more true um, of children who have been treated with either Spinraza or Zolgensma. We're finding that they're a lot stronger um, and just uh, don't have some of those type of issues that we had seen before treatment. Okay, so with that in mind, we have heard from many of our families that during this pandemic, they have either completely lost their home nursing help or have, have less hours of home nursing. So this is really uh, leaving increased responsibility of care to family members, which could mean that these family members have less time to care for themselves. And the best way to care for someone else is to be able to take care of yourself as well. So in many instances, there may be adjustments that can be made to a tube feeding regimen to allow for the caregiver to get more sleep, be able to better take care of themselves and really improve the quality of life for everyone involved. So I would encourage you to reach out to your dietitian um, if there are issues like this in your home and if that is just something that would benefit your overall family. Um, and in most cases, I would say there is something that can be done about that. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, and then finally, I wanted to talk about sick day management, as I assume that, you know, most families would like to avoid any hospitalizations during this time, if at all possible. So there's two major considerations in sick day management. Um, first is more frequent feeding, so reducing those fasting intervals that we just talked about. And the second thing is being able to um, keep the person with SMA hydrated and their electrolytes balanced. So um, if you have someone who is tube fed, uh, you might, and, and you're doing bolus feedings under normal circumstances, you might consider switching them over to 24 hour continuous feeds. Uh, because definitely when a person is sick and vomiting, having vomiting and or diarrhea and or a fever, um, they're at risk for dehydration because there is going to be extra uh, water and electrolyte loss. So I would recommend keeping some Pedialyte on hand if possible. But if you don't have Pedialyte, you can actually make your own electrolyte replacement solution that's very similar to Pedialyte by mixing a half a teaspoon of light salt, a half a teaspoon of baking soda, two tablespoons of sugar, and one liter, which is about 33 ounces of water. Now, um, some people know what light salt is and some people don't and where to find it. So you usually can find it just in the grocery store near where the regular salt is. Um, they're probably not gonna have a lot of it, so you're really gonna have to scan the shelves. Uh, but it's really important that you use light salt instead of regular salt because the light salt contains both sodium and potassium, whereas regular salt contains only sodium. And you do need both of those. And I'm assuming that most of us have baking soda and most of us have sugar uh, already in our pantries. So for people who do not have feeding tubes, um, I'm giving you some examples here of some formulas that are out there that are uh, high carb drinks, they contain protein, but they don't contain any fat. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, when someone who's orally fed is sick, they might not feel like eating, but they might be willing to drink one of, the, one of these, which tastes more like juice. So the, the one on the left, the Ensure Clear, and the one all the way to the right, the Boost Breeze, um, I believe that these are available uh, in retail stores, so you may be able to find those at a pharmacy. 
Uh, the one in the middle, the Ensure Clear Therapeutic, is actually the institutional version. And I think the only difference between that and the Ensure Clear on the left, the one in the middle definitely has more calories, but it might also be a, bi a bigger carton. So that one has 240 calories, where the other one only has 180, but they both have the same amount of protein. But in any event, all three of these, uh, you should be able to uh, find them online. And sometimes the best, least expensive source and most reliable way to get these is to actually order directly from the manufacturer. If you go onto Google and you just Google them and you find some other sites who are selling them, and especially if they're selling them at a discounted price, I would be very um, cautious about that because sometimes the reason that they're offering them at such low prices is because the product that they have on their shelf might be close to its expiration date. So the Ensure Clears are made by Abbott Nutrition and the Boost Breeze are made by Nestle Nutrition. And I believe that both of those companies have very easy uh, online ordering. So some possible adjustments that can be made uh, to tube feeding regimens when sick. Uh, so one thing might be to just make half strength formula. Um, so instead of uh, giving the full amount of formula that someone should get in a day, give them half and then mix it uh, with an equal part of either the Pedialyte or the homemade electrolyte solution. So for that day, they might not be getting all of their calories, but they're sick, so that's okay. And just giving them some calories is going to help um, avoid any uh, low blood sugar situations as well. Uh, if someone usually has bolus feedings during the day, you could switch to a smaller daytime bolus and then run some feeds overnight to make up calories. Or like I said before, you can go to 24 hour continuous feeds. But again, if someone's having increased secretions or fever, they are probably going to need extra fluid and you may even want to give about one and a half times the usual amount. But the most important thing really is to maintain contact with your healthcare team because they're gonna give you the best advice about whether you can continue to manage this illness at home or whether a hospitalization is going to be needed. So in summary, there is no better time to start improving your diet quality. What else have you got to do when you're locked in the house? So um, choosing protein, fat, and carb sources that are good sources of vitamins and minerals. Um, using supplements only when you can't meet your needs with food, and don't be afraid to try new foods. For tube feeding, your dietitian can help if you're having any formula supply or uh, in adjusting your tube feeding regimen so everybody can get more sleep. And then for sick days, maintaining hydration and electrolyte balance and staying in contact with your healthcare team. Thank you so much for your attention. And now we are happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Stacey, for a very informative and helpful presentation today. This is Jessica with Curasame, and we are now going to address some of those questions that have come in from our community. Um, also joining us for this portion of the Q&A session, we would like to welcome Becky Hurst-Davis, um, a licensed dietitian nutritionist at, at Primary Children's in Salt Lake City. So uh, Becky and Stacey, our first question, which looks like we received a few different variations of questions regarding the AA diet is, what exactly is the amino acid diet? And then second part to the question, what are the pros and cons of the AA diet? Uh, yes, thank you. This is Becky. I'll go ahead and, and take that. So the amino acid diet um, is a diet recommended by the SMA family community, and it's usually a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. Uh, and this diet contains, uh, and the formula that is used in this diet contains fully broken down proteins, also known as amino acids, as for the protein source. Uh, this uh, it usually starts with a, a low-fat, high-carbohydrate, free amino acid formula, and then uh, one might add pureed baby food or fruits and vegetables, dairy-free milk, juice, water, Pedialyte, vitamin and mineral supplements, and specific oils to provide essential um, 
fatty acids. Uh, there are pros and cons to this uh, diet. Um, the pros, I'll go with the pros first. If a person has very severe reflux, uh, the lower fat diet can help with these symptoms. Uh, the inclusion of a variety of uh, blended fruits and vegetables can help prevent and improve constipation. And the protein is completely broken down for those who cannot digest or have formula intolerance with regular proteins. The cons of this diet, it's very low fat and limited protein uh, for some versions. And this results in a diet that is very high in carbohydrates and simple sugars. Uh, because of the high carbohydrate, high sugar in the diet, this may affect blood glucose and it can increase triglyceride levels. Increased triglyceride levels uh, has the potential to increase risk of fatty liver disease. Uh, in this diet, because amino acids are a more broken down form of protein, they're rapidly digested. And so more frequent or continuous uh, infusions of the two feedings are needed for optimal protein utilization. Uh, for those with uh, normal or uh, only slightly impaired digestion, uh, this diet can sometimes result in very liquidy, bowel movements or diarrhea, and the diet must be carefully designed to avoid nutrient deficiencies and imbalances. I do also want to add that um, there have been no clinical studies um, in regards to this diet to determine um, the efficacy of the diet. Uh, Stacy, did I leave anything out? I think that you got everything, Becky. Great. Thank you, Becky, for addressing these questions. Um, the next question we received is regarding any nutrition strategies you can provide for help with constipation. Yep. Okay. This is Stacy. I'm going to take that one. So for people with SMA who do eat by mouth, uh, the first thing I always check on when I hear about constipation is to make sure that they are, they are getting in enough fluid. Um, I know that there are issues sometimes with, um, because needing help to go to the bathroom, uh, people tend to avoid uh, drinking too much fluid. So I always uh, try to encourage people to increase the fluid and that often sometimes is enough to help with constipation. You also want to include in the diet foods that are naturally high in fiber, like plenty of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, and legumes, and those go a long way. Um, for infants who are constipated, uh, sometimes just a little bit of prune juice or pear juice once or twice a day will do the trick. Uh, and then I've even had some other families swear by probiotics. And one thing, the one thing I would say about probiotics is that there are different strains and everyone's bacteria in their gut are different. So a probiotic that might work well for one person might not work well for another person. So if you try a probiotic and it doesn't work, you might even actually try a different strain uh, or a different bacteria probiotic. Uh, for people who are tube fed, again, we make sure that they're getting enough fluid through their tube. And we may even consider one of those uh, real food or plant-based formulas. Sometimes uh, uh, people have better bowel movements on those formulas uh, than some of the uh, older ones. And then really, if none of those strategies work, then sometimes we do have to go to medication like a Miralax, a Senna, or a Milk of Magnesia. Um, and that's when I usually defer to my uh, GI colleague to decide which of these is best for the particular person's situation. Anything that you wanna add to that, Becky? Um, I think the only thing that I would add to that is just if, um, if the constipation is acute, um, it's not the time to maybe uh, start with the nutrition strategies. You should reach out to your GI or your pediatrician uh, to help with acute constipation before um, going uh, with the nutrition strategies. Yes, that is an excellent point. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, another great question we received is, 
do nutrition recommendations differ for someone who has received Spinraza and or Zolgensma versus someone who is not currently on either treatment? Okay, this is Stacy. I'm going to take that one also. Um, so we really, as dietitians, we really are still learning about the nutrition needs of those uh, with SMA who have been treated with these therapies. And so I really can only speak uh, anecdotal, anecdotally to what I've seen so far in my clinic. So uh, one thing that I actually mentioned during the talk was that when receiving treatment with Spinraza, people do seem to need more calories than they did prior to treatment. So especially, you know, like I have some older uh, people with SMA, like, you know, maybe teenagers or young adults who are starting to receive treatment and, and, and they may be on tube feeding regimens. And I'm finding that those regimens that they were on before aren't adequate after they start receiving treatment. Um, for patients that I have who are following an amino acid diet, uh, one of the things we check on an annual base, uh, basis is plasma amino acid levels. And I'm usually finding that a patient following that diet um, will start to show low plasma amino acid levels after starting Spinraza, which is generally an indication of not getting enough protein. Um, and I have also found similar increase in needs for calories with a patient treated with Zolgensma after having been treated since infancy with Spinraza. But I have to say that to me, these results are not surprising. So to the extent that uh, people with SMA who are treated are gaining strength and more function, it makes sense to me that their nutrient needs are going to be higher. I'm also finding that children treated with the new therapies have fewer digestive issues. So if they still require tube feeding, they're more likely to tolerate a standard or real food formula and are not as much requiring things like partially broken down or fully broken down proteins. They're also more likely to tolerate bolus feeding regimens um, and are often able to meet 100% of their calories during the day without the use of any overnight feeding. Anything that you want to add, Becky? Uh, no, I think you uh, captured it all. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, an additional question we have, which actually has two parts to it, um, are there certain supplements or lab values to look out for specifically for this population? And then the second part, um, and would this vary if the patient were GT dependent versus PO feed? Okay, I'll, I'll take that uh, question. Um, so as Stacy mentioned in her presentation, um, Supplements are only recommended if you can't meet the food uh, needs for those or uh, if you're on a, a tube feeding formula, if your um, calorie needs are such in that you uh, cannot intake the volume of formula in order to meet your vitamin and mineral needs. And in those cases, uh, vitamin and mineral supplementation is needed. I think uh, Stacy had also mentioned, you know, uh, Probably the most common supplements that we will see um, are for uh, calcium and vitamin D. Um, and again, just the rest just really depends on whether or not uh, the vitamin and mineral needs are being met. I know that I, when I evaluate diets, I look at three days worth of diets, um, a diet record, a food record annually. Um, with my patients, and we will, um, if we're getting, we're, we're, we're shooting for at least 75% of vitamins and minerals, um, with the exception of calcium and vitamin D and, and bone-related nutrients, and we shoot for meeting 100% of those needs. Um, <clears throat> as far as labs go, uh, Stacy had mentioned um, the plasma quantitative amino acid. So um, let me preface this by saying that we. Uh, there are some labs that are standard that we'll do annually. And then, so those would be like a complete blood count uh, we will do at our institution annually. We'll do a vitamin D, so a hydroxy um, vitamin D lab um, every one to two years. Uh, more frequently if uh, vitamin D values are low and we're needing to supplement and, and uh, track that, but in general, uh, every one to two years. 
And then at my institution, we'll also do a comprehensive metabolic panel every year. Uh, we, I, we just like to do that because it uh, shows us liver function tests and glucose values, as well as, um, as other values that are helpful to us uh, to uh, determine if we maybe need to look at uh, either further testing or supplementing um, some foods. Uh, the rest of the um, labs that we'll run are really indicative and really depend on the type of diet that the person is on. It has not a ton to do with whether or not they're um, orally fed or too fed. Um, it really just depends on what we see when we analyze their diet. Um, so if we saw that somebody was, you know, uh, potentially not intaking enough zinc, then we would, um, you know, do a zinc lab. Um, for uh, people who aren't on the amino acid diet, we will do a plasma quantitative amino acid analysis annually as well. Um, anything else that you'd like to add to that, Stacey? Yeah, so, so just with regards to labs, uh, one of the things that I've started checking more regularly in my clinic are lipid profiles. So the cholesterol, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And this was really into in response to a paper that came out not that long ago that talked about um, the SMA population having, uh, uh, in, especially in children, having um, sort of lipid, like uh, abnormal lipid values more prevalently than people who don't have SMA. And my initial feeling was that I didn't really see that a lot, so I wanted to start checking that uh, with some of my patients. So I have started doing that. Oh yeah, that I, that's something that I have done as well. And, and as you were speaking, you made me also realize that I left out if I if I had um, if there was somebody on a low fat uh, diet, then I would also do an essential fatty acid profile yes. uh, just to make sure that we were getting adequate um, essential fatty acids in that diet. Agreed, yes. Great, thank you both. So um, our last question we we're gonna be able to get to today is, can you elaborate just a little more on having only 0 0.5 grams of protein per kilograms of body weight? So that was not per kilogram, uh, it was actually per pound. So, so, so th that is confusing. I, I tried to put it in, because um, most of us in America don't think about um, kilograms, we think about pounds, um, but actually a half of a pound, a half of a gram per pound is the same as saying one gram per kilogram. So maybe that's where people got confused. Because what one gram per kilogram for an adult is not too low of an amount of protein. That's actually the, the uh, recommended dietary um, uh, requ uh, recommendation. I hope that answers the question. All right, so it sounds like um, we're all set with our Q&A session for today. Thank you again, Stacey and Becky. Thank you. We would now like to introduce, yeah, sure. um, we would now like to introduce Travis Dickendesher, representing Genentech, who will be presenting on Genentech's update. All right, well, thank you so much to Kira Thame for organizing these virtual summits uh, and for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, so my name is Travis Dickendesher, and I'm a member of the medical team uh, at Genentech. So today I'll be providing an update on the Genentech Roche SMA program with a focus on the investigational medicine RISDAPLAM and the ongoing RISDAPLAM clinical trials for SMA. So before we begin, I have some important disclosures to provide. Uh, the purpose of this session is to provide general information on our SMA program and not to give specific medical advice. So of course, you should talk to your healthcare provider for any medical advice, including on current uh, or potential treatments. Furthermore, Rizdaplam is an investigational medicine being studied for the treatment of SMA and is being evaluated for its safety and effectiveness in clinical trials. Um, and it is currently under review by the FDA for the indication of SMA. 
So here's a look at the agenda uh, for today's presentation. So first, I'm just gonna say a few words about who we are, uh, the Genentech Roche organization, followed by an overview of the RISDA plan program and its history, uh, and finally, an update um, on the ongoing RISDA plan clinical trials. So Genentech was founded as a biotech company in 1976. And over the past 40 plus years, we've been dedicated to transforming the lives of people with serious diseases that have high unmet needs, from cancer to multiple sclerosis, from pulmonary fibrosis to hemophilia, uh, just to give a few examples. And then in 2009, uh, Genentech became a member of the Roche Group, a global organization focused on the development of medicines and diagnostic tools. So I think just the bottom line here is whether you see the name Genentech or Roche, you know, know that we are one uh, with more than 40 FDA approved medicines and now actually a nine year partnership uh, in SMA. Okay, so kind of turning our attention to Rizdaplam, uh, you can see here a brief timeline of the Rizdaplam program history. So in 2011, Genentech and Roche entered into a collaboration with PTC Therapeutics and the SMA Foundation to conduct non-clinical and clinical development of potential SMA therapies. So this led to the initiation of a phase one clinical trial of Rizdaplam in healthy volunteers at the beginning of 2016. And this was then followed by four currently ongoing clinical trials of Rizdaplam in patients with SMA. So you can see them listed here. We have the Sunfish trial in patients with type 2 and type 3 SMA, Firefish in infants with type 1 SMA, Jewelfish in pediatric and adult patients with SMA who have previously been treated with other SMA therapies, and then most recent, uh, Rainbow Fish in pre symptomatic infants with SMA. So, in total, the safety, tolerability, and effectiveness of Rizdaplam are being evaluated in clinical trials that span you know, a range of SMA types and ages. So it would be impossible to talk about our SMA program without emphasizing just how vital collaboration has been really all along the way. Um, I already mentioned the collaboration with PTC Therapeutics and the SMA Foundation, but in addition, you know, we, like so many others, are fortunate to receive feedback from organizations such as SMA Europe and, of course, Cure SMA. Um, I also want to express, you know, our sincerest gratitude to all of you, uh, to the SMA community, for your willingness to share your stories with us, as well as your perspective on the current and the future needs in the community. All right, so now I'm going to dig a bit deeper into the Rizdaplam molecule itself. So when designing Rizdaplam, three major factors uh, were taken into consideration. So first, that Rizdaplam would be a small molecule aimed at increasing SMN protein levels, the critical protein that is greatly reduced in SMA. Second, that Rizdaplam would be a liquid taken by mouth or feeding tube and thus distributed throughout the body. And third, that Rizdaplam would be a potential treatment for a broad range of patients living with SMA. So here's some more detail on that first point, that Rizaplam is a small molecule aimed at increasing SMN protein levels. So as you can see on this diagram, SMA is caused by either deletion or mutation of the survival of motor neuron one or SMN1 gene. This in turn leads to a reduction in SMN protein a protein that is critical for the survival of lower motor neurons. So to sum up, in SMA, there is not enough of this SMN protein. There is, however, a second gene, a backup gene, called SMN2, which is shown here on this diagram. SMN2 is very similar to SMN1, except that an important piece, which is called exon 7, is removed or spliced out roughly 90% of the time. So as a result of this splicing, most of the SMN protein produced by SMN2 is essentially a shortened version, 
that's not stable and it's not functional. So kind of what it all boils down to is that you get very little of the SMN protein that you need from SMN2. And this amount is not sufficient to compensate for mutation or deletion of the SMN1 gene. So thus, even with this backup SMN2 gene, you still have a deficit in SMN protein. So then how is Rizdaplam proposed to fit into this process? Basically, Rizdaplam is designed to bind to SMN2, shown here on the slide, helping to keep that piece, that exon 7, in so that it's no longer spliced out. So the idea is if you can keep that exon 7 in, you get more of that full-length functional SMN protein. And that really is, is the key point, that Rizdaplam is proposed to act on SMN2 to increase the levels of functional SMN protein. Okay, so the second major design consideration that I mentioned was that Rizdaplam is a liquid taken by mouth or feeding tube and thus distributed throughout the body. And we believe this is important because SMN protein is known to be expressed in many cell types and tissues, some of which are depicted here on this slide. Uh, in addition, reduced SMN protein levels have been reported throughout the body in patients with SMA suggesting that SMA is a multi-system disease that may affect cells beyond motor neurons. And so as an orally administered liquid, Rizdaplam is designed to reach a range of these SMN expressing tissues. All right, so the third design consideration I mentioned is that Rizdaplam is a potential treatment for a broad range of patients living with SMA. And this broadness is reflected in the Rizdaplam clinical trial program shown on this slide, consisting of the firefish, sunfish, jewelfish, and rainbowfish trials, all of which are ongoing global studies. So firefish is a study of Rizdaplam in infants with type 1 SMA from 1 to 7 months of age. Uh, it consists of two parts. Part 1 is for dose finding and evaluates multiple doses of Rizdaplam. And part two is for confirmation using the dose selected from part one. So there's no placebo group in the firefish trial. Thus, all participants receive Rizdaplam. So the main objective of part one is to select the appropriate Rizdaplam dose for part two, while also evaluating safety, tolerability, and the movement and action of drug in the body. The main objective of part two is to assess the proportion of infants sitting without support for five seconds after 12 months of treatment, as well as other measure, measures uh, of effectiveness and safety. Sunfish uh, is a study of Rizdaplam in those with type two or type three SMA from two to 25 years of age. So similar to firefish, sunfish consists of two parts, uh, part one is for dose finding, and again, part two is for confirmation. Sunfish is a placebo-controlled trial. Thus, for a portion of the study, there are some patients receiving Rizdaplam, while others are receiving placebo. And then, at a certain point in the trial, all patients switch to Rizdaplam treatment. Uh, the main objective of Sunfish part one is to select the most appropriate Rizdaplam dose for part two while also evaluating safety, tolerability, and the movement and action of drug in the body. The main objective of part two is to assess the change in the total score of the motor function measure 32, or MFM 32, after 12 months of treatment, um, as well as other measures of effectiveness and safety. Okay, so then Jewelfish uh, is a study of Rizdaplam in pediatric and adult patients with SMA ranging anywhere from six months to 60 years uh, of age. And participants in Jewelfish must have been previously treated with another SMA therapy before enrolling. All Jewelfish participants receive Rizdaplam with the main objective of the study to evaluate safety, tolerability, and the movement and action of drug in the body. And so lastly, we have Rainbowfish. And Rainbowfish is a study of Rizdaplam in infants with genetically diagnosed SMA who are not yet presenting with symptoms. 
and ranging in age from birth um, until six weeks. And again, all rainbow fish participants receive RISDAPLAM. So the main objective of the study is to assess the proportion of infants with two copies of the SMN2 gene that are able to sit without support for five seconds after 12 months of treatment. Uh, and the trial also evaluates measures of effectiveness uh, and safety. So I know that's a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of trials, a lot of fish, uh, but you know, the main point here is that in total, uh, RISDAPLAM clinical trials span a wide range of age groups from birth all the way until 60 years of age. All right, uh, so with that, I'm just gonna sum up today's presentation. Uh, I showed you that the investigational medicine RISDAPLAM is currently being studied as a potential new SMA treatment option. Um, it was designed to increase SMN protein levels to be delivered orally and distributed throughout the body and is being studied for its safety and effectiveness in clinical trials that span a range of SMA types and patient ages. Uh, the new drug application for RISDAPLAM was granted priority review status by the FDA and is currently being evaluated for the indication of SMA. And finally, Genentech and Roche are committed to continue to work with the SMA community to better understand the current and the future needs of patients and caregivers. So again, I'd just like to thank CareSMA for the opportunity to speak here today and, and also to all of you uh, for attending and staying a bit on even, even after the top of the hour. Um, I really hope you and your family stay safe in, in these challenging times, and I look forward to seeing you at a summit uh, or conference in the future. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Travis and Genentech, for your presentation. Um, again, we truly appreciate the wonderful presentations today, and we thank the speakers for their time and insight. Thank you to our sponsors, Abexis, Biogen, and Genentech, for making today possible and for their incredible support. And thank you to everyone who joined and listened in on today's webinar and for sharing part of your day with us. We will send out a follow-up email with the survey link from today's webinar, and we would greatly appreciate any feedback you can provide. If there are any additional questions we can help answer or anything we can do for you and your family, please reach out anytime to family support at curesma.org. Thank you again for joining us for our Summit of Strength webinar series, and have a great rest of your day.